Okay, there we go. Okay, and our next applicant will be Brentwood Townhomes. We're doing pretty good, Wes. We're only three minutes. No, I know it wasn't. It wasn't the board I was concerned about. It's when people start to read their document back to us that it, it's sometimes. Yeah, that was sort of what I was alluding to. We're doing fine. I, I don't want to cut anybody off. That's for sure. Okay. Do you know, Ashley, if this is a big team or? Um, I think we've got five people joining. So I just spoke with Anna and she said that they'll be joining in the next minute or two. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Brian. We'll give it a couple of minutes here. I see Anna just joined too. Shanna, okay, we got three. Almost there. <laughs> Almost there, getting close. I heard you had five, so I've been counting. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. And then I'm not sure, Anna, if you're sharing the presentation. Um, if, if you want to share your screen, I can let you know that we can see it while we wait. Okay, that looks good. Great. Janice, you're not seeing Trent in there, are you? Um, we really mm -hmm. him and um, we can probably get started. I just sent him a text message. No, it's just yourself, Anna, and I think it's Shanna. Yeah. It looks like they're having some internet troubles in uh, their Calgary studio, so I'm just seeing if he can jump on through a phone. Yeah. No, that was just Ty changing devices that came in.
Okay, there's Trent. Uh, Janice, I know we are still um, missing our, our client, but um, I think we're in a position to move forward. Um, and uh, Rob can join when he can. Okay, that sounds good. So I'll do a quick intro here and then I'll turn it over to your team. Oh, there's Rob. Perfect. Okay, um, so with this, we'd like to welcome you to the Edmonton Design Committee for the formal presentation of Brentwood Redevelopment. Uh, we would like to remind you that this is a public meeting. Uh, we have all received and reviewed your submission package and your team will have 10 minutes to present and then we'll go virtual round table the committee members for questions. Uh, after the presentation, the committee will deliberate and then we will respond to you in writing within 48 hours. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you and your team uh, to introduce yourself and the project. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for having us, guys. It's uh, been a while since we last met you back in October. Um, we're here as a delegation to present as our formal submission for the Brentwood redevelopment uh, here in Woodcroft neighborhood. Um, just as a quick reminder of who we are, uh, Rob is the executive director of the Brentwood uh, Community Development Group. Trent is the lead architect from Gravity Architecture. Shanna is our lead landscape architect from Tool Design Group. And Anna and I are planners with BNA Studios. Mm -hmm. Brentwood today is an affordable housing provider in our community with buildings that are reaching the end of their life cycle. The proposal before you allows for a comprehensive redevelopment to a multi-unit medium density development with complementary open spaces and limited local retail and community-based uses. We're seeking to rezone the existing RSM H12, uh, also known as RF5, and RMH16, also known as RE7, uh, property to a DC2 with a range of heights between 14 and 37 meters with parking below grade and a maximum floor ratio of 1.65. This equates to an overall increase of 3.7 times the existing density on the site. The site is located in the Woodcroft neighborhood just west of Westmount Mall and north of Coronation Park with great connectivity to transit and the overall transportation network. The site is located within the mature neighborhood with an array of amenities and institutions within a 10 minute walking radius, enabling opportunities for intensification. Based on the feedback we heard from EDC, um, our project team has brought forward additional information and focused our revisions on the direct control regulations. The primary areas of feedback relate to built form, sustainability, defining the open space, parking, pedestrian movement, community amenity contributions, and general information about public engagement. We have balanced the direct control with additional detail while trying to remain flexible to meet the needs of the project as it evolves, included infrastructure improvements to serve the development, and brought forward information to articulate our vision for the future. We believe we have a direct control that meets the needs of the community, city staff, and Edmonton Design Committee to the best of our abilities within the constraints of an affordable housing project tied to government funding. The highlights of the revised direct control include flexible phasing, variation in the built form, sensitive, sensitive interface along 115th Avenue, enhanced multimodal corridor, safe connections across 114 Avenue to Coronation Park, limited commercial opportunities to serve the community, and street-oriented homes where it matters most. Our extensive engagement program included three resident open houses, two community open houses, and letters throughout the process to ensure the community was informed. Broadly, we discussed built form, local sensitivities, impact of parking and traffic, need for open spaces, and other commercial needs. Trent, why don't I hand it over to you and just let me know when you want to go to the next slide. if Trent is still with us. <laughs> Mute, you think I would have figured that out by now. Thank you, Brian. Um, 
I want to talk a little. The, the first slide, we're we're talking about some sort of the, you know bit of the governing principles behind our approach to this to this master plan and this development. Um, of course, Brentwood is a is an affordable home uh, uh, provider, and so affordable living was obviously paramount in our in our discussions that produced the the work we're presenting today. Uh, diversity of residents is also a, a a key feature of the Brentwood model, um, and of course, you know, adhering to best practice uh, planning principles to deliver a, a thriving, healthy community. Uh, next slide, Brian. These are some inspirational images. Uh, of course, we're we're at a stage where we we have not yet submitted development permits, where a lot of these details will be will be more finely fleshed out. But these inspiration images uh, indicate uh, intention and, and possibilities for the the um, the inner uh, open spaces and activity nodes that we've provided through our master plan. So this includes natural play areas, community terraces, courtyard pathways. Uh, plazas, gardens, uh, open green space for gathering, play spaces, and of course, uh, you know, flush streets for for activities. Uh, Shanna later on in the presentation will speak a little bit more to the landscape to components in these activity nodes. Next slide, Brian. Built form, thank you. So this is our this is a, a an isometric view of the massing uh, proposed uh, to achieve uh, Brentwood's goals. What we're seeing here along the north edge uh, are in, on those green buildings are a stacked townhouse configuration, not more than three stories, to provide an appropriate interface to the low-density uh, street to the north. The balance of the, the buildings are made up of four, five, six, and one ten-story building on the on the southeast corner. Um, the, the the main floors uh, show some color changes. On the southeast building, uh, you know the tallest building. You can see the the red strip indicates commercial usage. So we are incorporating some commercial uses. The balance of the buildings are going to feature, um, you know, at grade units with uh, with access to grade, complete with amenity spaces and, and all the connectivity expected. Next slide, Brian. This slide uh, seeks to demonstrate uh, some of the desire lines and pedestrian connections that we identified early in the process and prioritized throughout the, the project. These desire lines were established in coordination with our transportation engineer to identify um, ideal paths of travel to provide optimal permeability, uh, addressing septed issues while still um, you know, providing obviously a, a comfortable, safe community that meets Brentwood's needs. Slide, Brian. This slide aims to describe some of the measures that we implemented to vary the height of the buildings to, again, provide increased permeability, primarily to sunlight. So our buildings, you know, as we can see, have some components with taller sections and lower sections. This was uh, strategically by design to provide penetration to sunlight throughout the, throughout the, the year. Um, providing light into the interior amenity spaces and, and, uh, and green areas. This is shown in the shadow study. Of course, the, the top row um, in winter, uh, it's, uh, you know, we see a lot of shadows as we do in the winter. Uh, the middle and bottom slides show the, uh, the um, other required time, the reporting times of the year where you can see the, the variation of the building height does allow sunlight to penetrate beyond that south row of buildings, and that's the outcome that the, the stepped facades and the varying heights was designed to achieve. This slide describes the parking strategy. One of the goals, well, a clear goal from the outset was to minimize vehicular presence on the surface of this project. We've, uh, we've provided efficient access to a series of underground parkades. Uh, the parkades are outlined in, in red. We have proposed three parkade structures uh, with the arrows indicating where the access is. The goal is to you know, eliminate through traffic, create a, uh, an urban walkable site uh, that is not dominated by vehicles and is not governed by vehicles. Uh, so obviously we need to bring vehicles into the site, provide parking, and this uh, demonstrates how we're doing it with minimal impact to the pedestrian connections and to the landscaped area. The 
This next slide is our phasing plan. Our phasing plan was developed, uh, well, this was a, a team effort, um, but in combination with uh, our civil partner to identify the optimal path forward to remove existing buildings and, and propose new buildings. The, as the progression arrows show, the phasing plan will move from left to right, systematically removing buildings and replacing them with, with new buildings. The strategy that, that we've devised with the consultant team and with Brentwood is one where you know, the new buildings are going to replace several of the existing buildings. And so the strategy will not see uh, any of the residents displaced offsite uh, during the construction of this project. The next slide shows some cross sections of our multimodal pathway as well as our, as well as the, uh, the locations of, of uh, uh, vehicle access. Uh, these separations demonstrate a commitment to providing clear, a clear multimodal approach where pedestrians and vehicles are separated by clear, have their own pathway or they're separated by landscaping and by buffers to ensure that there's very clear uh, connectivity and intuitive path, safe pathways through the site. For the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to our landscape consultant, Shanna. She's going to walk you through the balance of the slides. Shanna. Thanks, Trent. Um, so this slide shows our uh, master plan for the site. Uh, the principles for the outdoor space for Brentwood Redevelopment centered on uh, some of those values that Trent presented at the beginning of his slide. So nurturing the community, providing safe spaces for the diversity of residents throughout the site, and also su supporting sustainability through green design practices. So the outdoor spaces consist um, of a diversity of typologies that range from semi-private to public and from informal to formal spaces to support these principles. On the southeast side of the site, we have a community green and it's designed as a welcoming transition into the site for people walking and biking. Um, as outlined in the DC2 document, at a minimum of 2,000 square meters, the space can provide flexible uh, areas for passive gathering or small programmed events for Brentwood residents and the community. The space is also designed to support the potential ground floor commercial and residential units in the buildings that surround the site that Trent had pointed out earlier. <clears throat> On the northwest part of the site, um, we have a more uh, kind of relaxed play forest at a minimum of 500 square meters as outlined in the DC2. And it provides that softer edge and a more naturalized transition between the Brentwood community site and the neighboring low density residential sites. This site supports the kind of quietness of the surrounding community while still providing a welcoming entry through the site for people walking and biking. Additional amenity spaces are uh, scattered throughout the site, stitched together by a network of pathways to create a variety of spaces for everyone. This includes formal play spaces, areas for sports, and community gardens and gathering spaces. Opportunities for sustainable practices are also available throughout the site through elements such as increasing the tree canopy, using native and drought tolerant species, increasing biodiversity and pollinator species, and providing low impact development options where possible. Um, and the next, you can go to the next slide, Brian. The next two slides um, show a compilation of our um, graphics that share the design intent for the site, including the network of pathways that support play on the way and then and facilitate social exchange. You can go to the next one, Brian, but that's it. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to take questions. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we'll jump right in with David. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. I, I actually don't have any other questions of clarification. Um, I, I, all that um, I've noted is that when when this project does come back for DP, um, it would it'd be nice to see a little bit more design development information um, and intent with regards to how how you're sort of creating a site that has some year round form and function to it. And, and then when integrated with the site planning that you've sort of 
done through this 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 process and the architecture how how all of that starts to come together to create you know a unique sense of place and a new residential village environment as i said like i i really like the the moves that are presented in in this package and um and some of the precedent imagery and so on and so forth i, I it would be just it would be nice to see how that story is expanded into some sort of the design development for the site so anyway yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. And we're, we'd also love to get into the details. <laughs> let's let's get this moving forward. Okay, thanks for that, David. Uh, we'll go to Jonathan. Thanks, Janice. Uh, yeah, I know this is a uh, really exciting uh, to see. Um, I, I particularly like the uh, the pathways through the site. It, it seems to be um, quite porous, um, and uh, and I think that. The access that kind of cuts across the site actually worked quite well. The only thing that I would um, be concerned about is the um, septed considerations because it does create a lot of corners. Um, and I know in the package um, you did mention some uh, um, consideration for a septed. Uh, perhaps it needs a bit of a more of a mention in the actual DC text itself, just so that we make sure it's uh, it's in there. But I think uh, that's probably the biggest consideration I have. Um, on a site where we have so many, uh, you know, different pathways, which are obviously good, but also it creates kind of these, um, you know, unexpected corners. So I think that would be my main consideration for uh, a set of this size. But uh, other than that, I, I don't think I have any other comments. Um, yeah, looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And and the new zoning bylaw does give additional considerations that will be brought forward through the DP process. And as with every project, it's always a consideration to ensure, particularly for our affordable housing friends, that it is a, a safe environment. Um, and that'll be top of mind for Rob as, as they move forward with their implementation and ongoing operation of the site. For sure. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we're actually going to jump over Ty and come back to her. Uh, we'll go to Mindy. Thank you very much, Janice. Um, hi, Brian, it's nice to see you again. Um, I don't have any questions. I just really appreciate your very well thought out proposal for a very important project. Um, really appreciate it. I think it's really fabulous. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mindy. Appreciate that, nice to see you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Mindy. We'll go to Nick. Thanks, Janice, and uh, thanks, Brian, for good to see you again and happy new year to you i'm sure we'll catch up soon um, yeah. but as uh, i probably reflect uh, what mindy was saying i mean i think you know overall it, it's a really interesting project i've only got one question that's uh, just something that came up about the the step back i know it's in the dc mm -hmm. you've got the, this flexibility around i think you're at 1.5 you go on to two and the city usually has three and and then there's some provision for landscaping. Maybe you could just speak to that, what your thought process was behind it, because I think you might come across that one a bit as you move forward on the step. Well, yep, no, I appreciate that. Uh, why don't I turn over to Trent and he can speak it, to it from the architectural perspective. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so this slide does does reflect uh, the the two meter setback that has currently been, uh, been discussed on that Southeast building. Um, Brian, I'm not sure if it's able, we're able to zoom in on that a little bit, just so we can more clearly see the differentiation. My skills here. Oh, look at that, lovely. So, so this is the this is the tallest building that would be that would be eligible for the you know that would that would fall under that setback con consideration. Um, you know, we're open to to being flexible on on this setback, but we think two meters both provides an appropriate relief to the uh, to the facade. Um, you know, keeping in mind the adjacencies of, of the other buildings, we're not in a situation where we have an immediate adjacency to an existing context where there, where there might be, um, you know, a, a different level or perhaps a higher degree of sensitivity warranted uh, through the shadow studies and through the evaluation of, of the various uh, step backs. We think a two meter setback is will provide meaningful relief while still, you know, allowing the architecture to be flexible and uh, without impacting the adjacent buildings. So Trent, just maybe clarifying, the DC has all locating landscaping and mitigate the perceived mass of the street facade. So, you know, that the all means maybe there is no step back. So I'm just 
wondering that that's what I've got in the DC at the moment. So I'm just um, just curious on how you're, you you know bringing that into it. What was the intent? Uh, sorry, Nick. I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand your question. Maybe. Maybe. Can you? So, Brian, you're probably more familiar with what I'm talking about. In your direct control provision under ten four, you have ten point four two. This is over the twenty four meter mark. You have a two meter minimum setback, and that goes or. So it's not. It's or locating landscaping and mitigate the perceived mass of the street facade. So I'm just trying to clarify. The way I read that is. We might not have a set step back because if we have landscaping that meets the objective, I guess. Am I interpreting this correct, or is this just? I think. Moving? Yeah, it, I think it's just giving a variety of scenarios. I'm not sure how landscaping is going to hit the 24 meter mark um, to uh, disguise that. So I, I can't think of a situation where that's plausible. Um, our intent is to include the step backs, um, and um, as Trent is referring to, we are flexible on that. Um, we're just trying to be mindful of you know form and character and the work that we put in to ensure an affordable development um, for our clients. So, no, our intent is to have step backs appropriate above the 24 meter mark. Yeah, you might want to just look at restructuring that sentence in the DC. That's all because the way it's reading. And I agree with you, it doesn't make sense on the second part. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an easy correction on our, our side, for sure. All right. Anyway, thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. And thanks to your team. Um, look forward to seeing this being developed. So cool. Thanks, thanks Nick. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Nick. We'll go to Craig. Uh, thanks for the, the in-depth presentation and, and appreciate how uh, you responded to the comments from last time. Uh, Nick really did bring up a lot of exactly kind of what I was going to say. I, I would say, though, that the increased step back would allow for some amenity spaces for those units at that step back, whether it be for patios or whatnot. I know there's no direct relationship to another building, but it would be it would be a big benefit to those those occupants on those floors if they could use uh, that step back that roof area as amenity space because it overlooks uh, the park across the street um, I don't think I had any more questions though or comments Maybe if I can quickly respond, Craig, while, while you're thinking if there's something else there. Um, but part of the intention around uh, the form and character and the kind of undulating roof lines and the uh, creating some rooftop opportunities is to have more consolidated uh, amenity space. It's, you know, we're working through that. We're not 100% sure how much of that will be possible, but that's part of why we have the massing shown the way it is, is that we do see opportunities to create those rooftop amenities. We're very cognizant of, of course, putting them in the DC and the expectations, you know, when we're trying to get affordable housing funding from uh, three orders of government. So um, you, you're not seeing it locked in, but our intention through that was to create more common space rather than just having a few units with that kind of opportunity. But regardless through the detailed design of what would be 15 years from now we will certainly get into what that looks like at that stage and you know obviously edc will have an opportunity to review those at that time too to to make improvements as you see fit uh sounds good and um sorry if i missed it uh underground parking on this site and will how would that impact any of the landscaping plan or green areas <clears throat> Yeah, Thanks. why don't I turn over to you, Trent and Shanna? Yeah, so the the red outlines are indicate the the extents of our of our proposed parking structures. You can see that they they largely fall underneath the building the buildings proper, um, but we do we are connecting them between buildings. Now the the commitment is that the the depth of those parkades will provide enough uh, soil coverage that the landscaping above grade uh, will not be affected. And, and I would add that care has been taken to keep them largely out of particularly the main amenity areas. Uh, there's only kind of one space between E1 and E3 where it cuts up that, that amenity space. But for the most part, it's kept underneath the buildings out of the landscaped areas as much as possible. Gotcha. Yeah, I see it now. Thanks so much. That's it for me.
Okay, sounds good. Craig, we'll go to Emma. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I really love this project. Um, I would echo um, sort of David's comments about the the design development. Like, I think the intent is really clear on the open space and landscape, which is really great. But I was I was hoping to see more like intent on the architecture itself and kind of what the vision is for the um, the overall development. Um, and I'm just well, I'm just curious. I know we're just in rezoning, but do you have any thoughts on on how an architectural language would be applied to this development? Would it change by phase? Are you thinking about a consistent uh, kind of look and feel? Um, and if you would consider adding any language into your the zoning document about how the relationship of um, the architectural response will either be consistent or not across the phasing of the project. I'll, uh, Trent, if you could start and I'll touch on the zoning. Sure, that sounds good. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, we have started having, uh, you know, both discussions within our within our firm as well as with our client as we as we you know look to to begin, you know, more meaningful building by building design uh, work. And you know, there isn't a there isn't a a will or a or a desire for all of these buildings to look the same. Um, and I don't think that would really be the expectation. I think that there's an opportunity to establish a you know. Um, a consistent design language that still allows for each building to be responsive to its position on the site in the way that it responsibly needs to. And that could mean that there are different architectural aesthetics and, and approaches, um, you know, taken with, with, you know, with different buildings on this site. I think that there can still be a, a feeling of cohesiveness that is obviously our goal with that while still allowing for these buildings to have, to have, to have some individuality and to to respond to their locations. So I, that speaks broadly, but that's our that's how we're thinking about this at this stage. Yeah, and maybe just building off of that, and generally speaking about um, you know the the time frame of this project. Of course, we're always um, hopeful of a project that progresses at lightning speed. But our Edmonton market, unfortunately, sometimes sets us back and disappoints us. We are very reluctant to enter into any regulatory text um, centered around design. Um, design language and intent. We've put in a lot of uh, thought around form and character, but leaving lots of flexibility for EDC, for the client, for the community to reflect on how the design can evolve over potentially several decades. So we're we're really just not at that point to be able to enter into or entertain that type of regulatory language on design, but we look forward to having that conversation with the first development permit and perhaps setting the tone for what will be the future of Brentwood. No, that's fair enough. And then um, my second question was, I was just curious, and I'm sorry if you missed it, but like, what was the feedback from the public engagement? Like, was it was it positive? I, I know that there's a really good community over in, in Woodcroft, so yeah. be curious to see. Yeah. What that was. You know, we'll have wine sometime, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> but, you know, centered around zoning bylaw renewal, district planning, major developments happening, infill happening throughout the city. This this neighborhood's going through a transition of what was, you know, your typical 1950s, you know, suburban boom into now a redeveloping neighborhood. And it comes with a lot of anxiety and quite frankly, over engagement and a little bit of burnout. So what we heard was a lot of support for the project, a lot of support for Brentwood. Um, loved everything they were seeing, you know, the usual concerns on traffic and parking and heights, um, which we've absolutely done um, our best to mitigate um, everything, quite frankly. And I, I think we've met the community head on with where their needs are and what the desires are of Brentwood. But I, you know, stepping back as a, you know, as a, a planner and a citizen and, and all those things, this community is going through live uh, becoming a redeveloping neighborhood. So, you know, just lots of um, lots of bubbling, <laughs> lots of simmering. Okay, no, sounds great. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that, Emma. We'll go to Kevin. Thank you, Janice, and thanks, team, for the presentation. Um, it's clear that this project, at least at this committee, without putting words in anyone's mouth, is universally loved. It's a pretty strong word, but everyone is super supportive of it, based on what I'm hearing, my interpretation of what I'm hearing. 
Um, and for me, the reason I love this project is because of the richness of the public realm design. Like you, the buildings are just masses. You haven't attributed any sort of architectural style. We have no idea what they'll look like, but the plans give a really strong sense of the character and quality and contribution of the public realm. And this is where me and planning kind of separate. I, I'm more of a detailed design guy than a, a planner, but um, the, the DC2 guidelines really only talk about two spaces, their general size, and what they may contain. And Brian, you just said you're really hesitant to apply any regulatory language to design. And, and that's fair, because I don't think it matters whether everything's asphalt or concrete or um, modernist or Victorian style or what stylistically how it ends up. But um, especially because this is affordable housing and, um, you know, I feel like that deserves this richness of, of amenity. How are we sure that when the pro forma is challenged that the this rich, really high quality public realm is going to make it through the process and that this project will remain universally loved and supported and that not to be too pessimistic but that you know this process isn't i don't know creating marketing materials more than creating a plan that's actually going to be put on the ground yeah it's a great question kevin and it's something we've wrestled with since the start of the project um, you know, we've we've all bought into the project. We've designed what we believe is real. Our client has wholeheartedly embraced this, and we've shared it with the community. Um, you know, I think we all kind of have to hold ourselves accountable to the vision that was set out. And you know, could our client turn around and sell the whole site? Um, you know, maybe. Um, and that's, I guess, that's part of the the land development process. But because it's affordable housing and because the future is always uncertain in that space, reliant upon three orders of government working together to provide housing for Edmontonians, um, we really just have to be cautious about the direct control being a trap to lock in every ounce of every discussion. You know, we believe that we can make this happen, but we have to build in the flexibility to move something there, change this, you know, accept that. Um, and through future EDC conversations, through ongoing land development, we're going to learn a ton. And so we would just hate to be at a point where Brentwood has to go back and have a difficult conversation with council that we have to change regulations because of lack of funding from the city, lack of funding from the province or elsewhere. And so uh, we're building that flexibility. We're, we're, we're making a commitment to build this, but we're also building the flexibility to be dynamic over the next 15, 20 years. And, and unfortunately, that's just the space we're in and how you manage large sites of this nature. If we were talking about a single site, really difficult for me to say, well, I can't describe, you know, that little parquet. This is not that. And we really have to be thoughtful about funding for the future. I'll also share that through the funding formula for affordable housing, and some of you may or may not know, um, every ounce of these costs are not covered by funding. Um, going back for TIAs and new plans and new rezonings are not necessarily covered. And every ounce of costing that goes into the building reduces the actual scoring criteria to receive the funding. So we're very um, focused on how we create an affordable project that is flexible while still achieving the aspirations of the community. And I suppose it's a bit of a trust um, game, but this is where we are in the state of affordable housing in Canada. Okay, fair. I, I totally trust your, your uh, approach and your judgment. You know much better than I how it all works, but I'm um, I'm very smitten with the plan, and I really hope to see it. Well, I am too, Kevin. So let's let's I'm hold it better one day, so. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Well, I, I think I think as an additional comment, this this site has been designed to to be more flexible vertically than 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 horizontally, and so you know there are smaller buildings and taller buildings with varying degrees of height, and there are you know little bits of flexibility within that 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 are not going to compel the project team to consider changing the footprint substantially or or encroaching onto the the uh, the public space or the landscaped uh, activity centers that have been provided so there is some robustness built into the design that uh, that can um that is 
can secure against that. Okay. And then my next question is one that is pretty pragmatic, but how do you see the implementation of that central kind of diagonal spine, the multimodal spine that goes through the site when it's going to be developed in such a phased manner? Like, um, will you be able to get a contiguous connection going through the site in phase one, or does that connection not really appear until the final phase is done? I'll hand that over to you. It's it's kind of in the middle. Um, we won't be we won't be building the full the full northeast to southwest connection in phase one. I think it comes on. It gets partially built through phases two and three and four to sort of connect that that east edge. And then I believe it's completed in the early phases once we move to the east half of the site. So it's it's not going to be the first thing that goes in, but it's also not not going to be the last thing that goes in by any stretch. So we're trying to, you know, our phasing plan is designed to provide, you know, to, to, to stretch ahead a reasonable amount to, to provide for those future phases while still ensuring that every phase is, is viable and sensible and, and, uh, and, and can go forward smoothly. Okay. Thank you again very much. Hey, thanks for that, Kevin. Uh, we'll go to Ty. Thanks very much, guys, for the presentation. And yeah, thanks, Kevin, for, I guess, just uh, summing up that I, I think there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of support for this project, myself included. Um, I guess that the one question, and, and sorry to keep dwelling on this step back uh, question, but I, I just wanted to clarify, like, it, it sounds as though, uh, you know, requirements for having some step backs would be triggered for, uh, it says portions of buildings above uh, 24 meters. Um, and I, I guess I was just hoping you could clarify, um, I, I guess, why that's so high. Because that's like eight stories, right? So I, I guess I would just, um, I, we're, we're used to more sort of three-story, four-story podiums, um, you know, to, to make it a little bit more human scaled. But is that just to, to kind of keep the regulations flexible? Um, enough to allow for some architectural discretion at, at the, the later phase? Um, or is it, um, was there something intentional uh, or some reasoning behind that 24 meter mark? So this has been kind of a, quite an interesting conversation with city administration with the bylaw renewal rolling out and some of the regulations being revised and um, additional powers given to the city to deal with form and character, as everyone knows. So, um, you know, our intention is that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full setback or step back. There could be some variation in the facade treatment. Um, the reality is we, we don't know the design at this stage. And so we're just trying to consider what level of flexibility is appropriate to ensure good design, a cost effective design, a cost effective development, while still, um, you know, kind of coming back to the principles around why step backs are used. Um, Trent, I don't know if you want to build off of that or if there's anything else there. Um, why the eight story mark versus kind of lower uh, what we would see in a smaller scale development? Yeah, I think you I think you summarized it well, Brian. Um, the uh, you know, there are there is a, a, a construction cost factor to to step backs that, you know, wood frame can be challenged to have step backs. It complicates the structure. And, and so we think that this is a this is a development with it. You know, these buildings are going to be designed with adjacent the adjacent future phases in mind and so you know i think the having the flexibility of being able to you know design sensitively um you know without necessarily having a third floor or second floor step back i think is ultimately a, a strength for the project that'll that'll be revealed as the development permits roll out okay no that that is really my only question so thank you thanks ty Okay, thanks for that, Ty. Uh, similarly, I have nothing further to add than what we've already heard from the other committee members. Um, so with that, we would like to thank you for bringing this before us. And uh, I think we're gonna jump straight into deliberation here with the committee. Um, maybe I'll open up the floor to the committee members. Any, any comments or thoughts? Maybe I'll pick on Kevin. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I just, 
I think there can still be flexibility. And this, again, I'll look to my uh, colleagues who are professional planners here. Um, but I think there can be flexibility while still um, being more specific about what some of the contained amenities will be. And I, you know, this is affordable housing and that the number one priority for me is that there is affordable housing for people and, you know, first and foremost that it happens. And then second is that it's well designed um, and contains those amenities. But I know there's a balance there between keeping it affordable. Anyways, how I feel like there needs to be a way that could give greater certainty that some of these wonderful amenities that are proposed are more likely or certain to end up on the ground and that includes the network like the kind of fine grain network of trails and paths the kind of diverse landscape cover with you know maybe a certain portion of tree cover or the different um, recreational amenities whether it's a sports court or a open lawn or just a little bit more specificity about what elements are contained overall in the project not necessarily a layout or anything but just uh, dig in a little bit more but I'm um, again this isn't my world in practice hey Nick yeah I think the real challenge that Brian and his team has is as he mentioned it's though it's seen as a small size a big site that's going to take quite a while to develop and I always respect the fact the challenges if you get too detailed then you know things change over time and i think the dc in itself when you look at it has the elements in there um, to sort of give some balance between it and so i think kevin it's really looking at the the dc and, and the how that's written but you know i always say i i as a plan i'm always saying you gotta think about tomorrow and, and things change our technology is changing a whole lot of things change um I think, you know, it's challenging when you have to come back and redo the whole thing. So it's just making sure the principles are in there, which is important. It's just how much detail you go into keeping in context the life of the project and the, go the goal of the affordability side. So hopefully that might help. But I do know where Brian, how he's pos positioned this uh, for the DC. So hopefully that helps, Kevin. <laughs> well, I don't know, because I... You know, I looked at the DC and of course I focused on the open space and really it just says the two sizes, the 500 square meters, the 2000, and it may contain certain elements. And that's kind of it. And um, I think that, that creates the opportunity to address it at the time when they build um, in terms of the more detailed components and what mm -hmm. those elements might be at the time. but. That's, yeah. I mean, it is a challenge. I'm not discriminating because you're looking now and and what you're looking at is setting something up that could be a 10, 20 year development rollout. So, and that's the challenge with DCs in my opinion and why I'm not a big fan of them because they can hem you into what tomorrow brings. Now, now Kevin, are you, are you looking at um, something that would be more aligned to with what we see typically with like, like building usage, right? Like on the building side, you typically would say your tenant spaces would include, you know, <clears throat> bars, daycares, what, whatever the usage yeah. is. Like, are you looking for a little bit more prescription regarding that identified? Because I think they do a great job identifying at least the amenity spaces and where it's going to be located, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but are you looking for more details similar to what we typically would see for those, um, you know, like interior building uses? Yeah, that's a good way to put it, Janice. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, uh, because like item two and three there really break it apart for like the sub area uses um, to tell you what those areas may potentially be used for so i don't know whether yeah. or not if if we do put a comment forward into that that we sort of reference that that's what we're looking for yeah and maybe it's just the use of the word may um and again i i uh <laughs> um 
I'm, I might be asking for more than this document should should provide just based on really wanting to see it come through as it's designed today. Um, so I don't know, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from some other colleagues whether I'm, you know, asking for more than is appropriate at this stage or whether what I'm saying resonates at all. I, I, would, I would just suggest that we, we make that comment and leave it to uh, the development officer to, mm -hmm. to further review with, with Brian and, and his group. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from. I, um, I, I, I do think that I, I do understand um, the proponent's position. And okay. I, I do understand our position. <laughs> yeah, and what we're saying because, um, yeah, that the worry is that we go ahead and and make a motion of support for uh, this uh, rezoning, and you know what has been, you know, provided to us in you know, in an illustrated format, and then find that there's so many loopholes in <laughs> in that you know the rezoning and the design regulations that that the whole when it comes back as a dp then yeah um edc has really no recourse if if you know these things have sort of slipped through those those loopholes so anyway yeah very often the pro forma gets brought up is like well we just couldn't make it work and in affordable housing i you know first and foremost there needs to be housing that's affordable so but it would be really nice if it could be great affordable housing and if there's some way to embed that but yeah i i guess my only comment to that would be that um really the developers already made a commitment really to the community yeah going through this process and and going through that engagement process yeah so it's a very fair point it's going, it's going to be very difficult moving forward to come with something completely different <laughs> as as a development package or a staging package so anyway yeah very fair okay and any other questions or comments or thoughts or is anyone prepared to bring forward a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion of support. <clears throat> okay. Can and I I'll... get a seconder? And can I'll I get Ashley that. to share screen? Actually, can we talk about one? I did have one thing to. Sure. Um, on the design regulations 10.2, it talks about ground oriented units fronting 115th Ave only now um currently the whole site has that facing all streets um is that something we want to ask for along 114th as well okay so you were referencing 10.2 10.2, uh, we have ground-oriented units fronting 115th Ave. Um, they don't talk about the rest of the site, though. And kind of, I think some of the beauty of what exists there currently is that all along 114th, there are, there, there are those entrances, which gives a lot of life uh, to that street now and gives a, a, a few more connections to to the surrounding areas whether it's the playground on 139th the, the park the the ball diamonds which are quite heavily used I agree with that yeah I think I think that's an important consideration because it, it's as it is now is quite successful in terms of you know the development not turning its back on such a large amenity directly across the street and, it, and maybe it's just because i live nearby and i know that that's a shortcut and i know we work on traffic and like try, trying to slow down people along that road and if we turn the back the buildings turn their back on that road 
are are we going to make that condition worse? Yeah. It was 10.2, correct? Yeah. So I'm just going to read ahead in 10.3, see if I'm missing anything else. Maybe they speak to it. I think that's a, a reasonable consideration. I think, yeah, I think how you have it written is good. Janice, I'm wondering if we could, I'm just saying if it's appropriate, just getting clarification on that section that I referred to about the setback and the trees where it says or, I think it just needs. Uh, which, which section? Can you just give me the yeah. reference section number? I will just bear with me one moment and I'll go down. I think it's 10 point. Oh, just bear with me. Okay. Uh, 10.4.2 and 10.4.3 is the word or needs to probably be removed. Doesn't seem to flow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any any other comments? Just a thought on I don't know step backs. I, I really don't like step backs, but that's just me being like me. But I hope that the as the the development does get progressed, that they don't kind of fragment the really strong kind of massing and cohesive kind of development that they've, if that makes sense. Like I think the massing makes sense like as a whole. So hopefully it doesn't get broken down sort of too much, but that's just a side thought on step backs. That's all I have, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think we'll have an opportunity or the future committee will have an opportunity to comment on that during um, DP. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, I do have one question. Uh, and I think it was David who wrote the intro section. Um, when we say ensure that they are providing adequate prescription written information, um, is there any specific area that we feel that they are lacking? I'm I'm just trying to look at this from a development officer perspective, right? Like no, nope. I was just responding to Kevin's, you know, um points of discussion that I you know, we just want to make sure that that you know what what is sort of provided in that quality and richness arrangement of um the illustrated information is you know adequately related into um the, the rezoning and design regulation so it was not it's not referencing any specific area it's just a general commentary right 
Do you think it needs more, Janice? No, I, I just wanted to know if there was anything specific. You know what I mean? Like if you're a development yeah. officer, yeah. is it was there something specific when you were reading it? But if it's just a generalized comment, I think it's it's fine. I just wanted to make sure we weren't missing the mark of Yeah. The only thing that comes to mind would be the diversity in scale and type of amenities and the the kind of fine grained nature of the circulation network, pedestrian circulation network. Okay, so say those two again. Sorry, Kevin. No, that's okay. I'm trying to find the link, but well, I'll just. I, I would put that as a as a for example, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking of. Totally. We just, yeah. just add it here. So we said um, diversity in um, scale and type of amenities. Did you say type? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I can't spell. And the fine grain quality of the pedestrian circulation network. I'd be more than happy with that as a comment to the DO. Yeah, I I think it just provides that little yeah. bit of totally. like what granular level are we actually looking at, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm good with what we've got. We can definitely work with that. Uh, any other comments from the committee before we go for a vote? Okay, not hearing any. So we'll uh, we'll go for a vote on the motion of support as shown on the screen. Uh, we'll go in the committee question order. So, David. Support. Jonathan. Support. Ty. Support. Mindy. Support. Nick. Support. Craig. Support. Emma. Support. Kevin. Support. Janice. Support. Motion passed. Okay. And with that, um, I see some of the applicants is still on the call. Um, we'd like to once again, thank you for bringing this before us. And uh, we're actually gonna move on in the agenda. Uh, so right now for the committee, we have a break scheduled until 6.40. Um, so with that, I take it, Ashley, we're still on schedule with that with Kazian. <laughs> yep, we're right on time. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so the committee will do a roll call at 640. Um, everyone enjoy their quick supper break.
Okay, maybe we'll do a quick uh, roll call. Uh, Craig? I'm here. David? Yeah. Emma? Hi. Hi. Jonathan? Okay, we'll come back to Jonathan. Uh, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Finding that mute button hard sometimes. Uh, Kevin? <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to Kevin. Mindy? I'm here. Nick? I'm here. Ty? Hey, Peter. You joined us too. Good, good evening. Okay, just give it a quick. Okay, we'll just give Kevin and Ty another moment. Oh, Dean, we apparently have a little feedback coming from you. Oh, do you? Okay. Uh, <laughs> kind of strange. He is an external speaker. Turn that one off. That's it. Turn that one off. No. No, it's the only sound system we set up. Oh, okay. it might. Be better now. Okay. <laughs> and do you know, Dean? Are you waiting on more? Uh, no, I, I've got Ed Hawks, uh, the owner's rep from Morgard, with me. So it's just the two of us. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll give Kevin and Ty just another moment. We do have quorum without them, so we may just move forward. I'm back. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Okay, well, maybe we'll jump right into this uh, if you are ready on your end. So we would like to welcome you to the Edmonton Design Committee for the formal presentation of Rice Howard Place Facade Improvement. Uh, we would like to remind you that this meeting is public. Uh, the committee has all received and reviewed your submission package. Your team will have 10 minutes to present, and then we'll go over to a round table with members for a round of questions. Uh, after the presentation and the questions, the committee will deliberate, and then we will respond to you in writing within 48 hours. Well, we still do have some feedback. Kind of strange. I was going to say, we weren't even talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's as though I can hear myself, is what it is. Mm. Um, but that's okay, we'll we'll make do. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you should be able to share your screen. Shit. One second. And then once you share, I'll just let you know that you need to see it. Okay, you should be able to do it now. Yes, we can. Okay, and anytime you wanna get started, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Jess. So I'm Dean Bevanetto, an, arch with, uh, sorry, an architect with Kizzy and Architecture. Sorry, I've got the 100-day cough, so I've got my water and, and my um, uh, medicine here if I start coughing, but I apologize in advance. So uh, knowing we only have 10 minutes, uh, I'll be uh, as concise as I can. I won't go through all the sheets that we've submitted. I know a lot of the members have seen our pre-design uh, submission and presentation uh, months ago. Since then, uh, I'll say we've been working very hard with both Morgard and uh, Shannon, our construction manager, to incorporate the comments that we received at the pre-design session um, and try to also work with members of the City of Edmonton. We've had, uh, uh, so I'll say, several meetings with Councillor Stevenson uh, in looking at how we can address some of the comments uh, you, uh, the team had along uh, 
100 A Street to the east of our property, uh, as well as working with uh, Tom Gervan, the director of the Downtown Vibrancy, to look at materiality on the sidewalks as well, uh, and incorporating that into sort of our revised uh, package that's been submitted to, to you back in November that we're presenting today. So based on that, um, Again, I'm going to skip through uh, this, knowing that most of you have already had a chance to read this, so we've already presented this once, but just highlight on what elements we have incorporated into the changes since our, our initial presentation. So uh, the first thing was looking at materiality and the comments that we had received uh, back then, trying to tie in more with you know some of the language around Rice Howard Way and recognizing that it is an eclectic sort of architecture mix, but uh, taking out the best of it. So uh, from our perspective, that meant masonry that makes uh, a lot of these streets in Edmonton. Uh, when I think about White Avenue, 104th Street, and the existing Rice Howard uh, Way in the amount of masonry and how that makes uh, sort of an urban pedestrian uh, feel and uh, vibe that uh, we were trying to build upon, knowing that Rice Howard is one of uh, the most successful streets in Edmonton. So initially, uh, back at our pre-design, we only had a three-foot sort of continuous masonry base that went around all three major sides from Jasper Ave to 100 A Street to Rice Howard Way. And from your comments, we re-looked at that and uh, introduced a significant more of masonry around all three sides, um, recognizing that that uh, will sort of change the character of the building, tied in uh, a little bit better with what's happening with the historic parts of Enbridge. Uh, and create just a, a sort of a better sense of uh, scale and feel to the pedestrian realm. Working with Shandos, knowing that that would have budget um, uh, implications, but uh, understanding that it was important and was important to Morgard as well from a durability and it's sort of creating that sense of place. Another thing we did was spent a little bit more time looking at the historic elements of um, Enbridge and noticing that you know the windows are treated with the stone. Uh, corner. So instead of just having flashing like we originally think uh, proposed, all of the windows now have a stone cornice as well to bring in that sort of, I'll say, romantic language uh, to the um, architectural material palette. Also, we you know looking further at what the uses might be on that main floor and uh, uh, making some changes to the interior design, specifically to the north east corner on the main floor. Uh, I suppose that was going to be sort of a, a general seating area for tenants. And now that's been changed over to incorporate a future restaurant. So again, the main entry, uh, the most used entry into um, Rice Howard Place is off of uh, Rice Howard Way at that northeast corner. And so that's where we're proposing a restaurant that would face onto 100 A Street. Um, and so that's being uh, uh, played up today with the canopy that you're seeing on this image, uh, as well as an exterior entry that would come off 100 A Street. And I'll get into the language about canopies and the trees uh, maybe a little bit further on. <clears throat> uh, we've had several discussions, uh, mostly with Tom Garavan, the director of the downtown vibrancy, regarding uh, the sidewalks. We've walked the site with him many times, as well as Councillor Stevenson. And we came to, I'll say, an agreement and a direction from him, because our original proposal you'll see in the site plan later on was to uh, continue with the pattern that Morgad had both on Rice Howard Way on Jasper Avenue with a, a specific stamped or a treated colored concrete pattern and working with Tom he's given us the direction that it would be acceptable if we use the pattern that was used on Enbridge uh, with the sidewalk <clears throat> in the same coloring the same um, pattern but instead of using uh, where they use granite stones, still using it in, in uh, concrete, mimicking the same colors and mimicking the same pattern. And that would go along 100 A Street on the east side. Uh, and Morgan would retain the, the current sidewalk pattern that they did on Rice Heart Way, as well as Jasper Avenue. And he said that would be acceptable to the city of Edmonton going forward. So that was what we've changed on our site plan as well. <clears throat> Recognizing that we've the canopies that we have shown um, on the east side and where there's existing, there's six existing trees. The ones further uh, north really only have a two inch caliper. The ones further south have a, are more mature, but 
looking at the future of how those canopies grows and old canopies. And, you know, we've proposed to Melissa Campbell, uh, that was the contact we were given to look at, could those trees be moved further east to allow them to continue to grow and, and uh, mature? Because uh, we think it's vital to the success and, and redevelopment of 108th Street that canopies are provided. And again, we're providing canopies where we're proposing we're going to have a restaurant and maybe uh, another retail further south down that could be a retail or a cafe. And having that sort of human scale below them, providing lighting, shelter, all of that adds to sort of the urban aspects that we think is critical for uh, 108th Street to, to um, be a better street than it is today. Uh, sorry. From a historic perspective, we're still looking at doing those perforated uh, uh, language with the uh, landmark silhouettes and looking at historic images that uh, of retail or that existed in all the other way and providing that on the building elevation to really provide a piece of art, but uh, a no to the past of the development. And so that hasn't changed from our original design. <clears throat> Again, we still have the operable windows uh, proposed along um, Rice Howard Way and 100A Street. And again, those would, with the intent of just turning the building inside out, it's really the whole premise of, of the redevelopment is to engage Rice Howard Place with the district. And by doing so, uh, allowing those windows to open up in the summer and in the fall time uh, to really animate uh, both Rice Howard Way and uh, you know, 100A Street. <coughs> Uh, so here's the site plan I spoke about. This is, of course, the graphics not as strong as it should be, but again, the intent is we continue the pattern that's existing from uh, Enbridge, and then, um, except the only difference is it would be in, in cast in place concrete with the same color. Um, and so that continues that urban fabric uh, onto our development. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, the main for, I'm oh, sorry, that's concourse. The main floor plan, again, uh, to the north where we've got the canopy shown and that's where we'd have the operable windows and to the east side uh, canopy in this area where the restaurant would have a, an exterior access and possibly future patio. And the second canopy in this location with a uh, entry point as well for this future retail. Mm. So the rendering from Rice Howard, uh, sorry, from uh, Jasper Avenue really hasn't changed since our initial uh, submission from the past. Um, the elevations along 100 A Street, you'll see a significant more amount of uh, brick that we incorporated that's going the full height of the podium uh, to the underside of our metal panels on, on the um, second floor as well. Uh, there was also comments uh, on the corners, incorporating the materials a little bit better. They look like they stopped short, so we were conscious about that. And now we've uh, corrected that, adjusted it, so that uh, it really plays up. These as the significant entries with these wood sort of panels and wrapped the corners a little bit more intelligently than, than they did last time. Again, this is the <coughs> elevation along Rice Howard uh, Way with metal panels above and the masonry brick in um, along the entire uh, base, but also used as uh, Future elements that go up uh, on the upper levels as, as well. Um, and then the final elevation along 100, 101st Street, again, uh, playing up the entries, making sure that the materials that uh, we had proposed before make more large bone, how they wrap the corners, and then a uh, simple material pallet along. 101st Street on the boat, but again, masonry brick continuous along uh, all of the units. I know I'm getting close to my end, but um, uh, going after, going after the entries, and again, you can see now that we've sort of resolved the corners uh, better than we had before in terms of the material wraps and uh, playing up where the major is on the facility. Um, and again, another shot along Rice Howard Way with canopies uh, and the operable windows, which would be similar along uh, 100 uh, A Street as well. Uh, 
Okay, so I know I've come to my NS, and this is, uh, just play up again, this is our major entry off of Rice Howard Way, the main entry that uh, most people come into the building. Um, and again, just, you know, the amount of effort we're trying to put into 100A uh, Street to really make that a special place, as special as Rice Howard Way is. Um, and in our mind is uh, by creating a lot more um, uh, street frontage with glazing, uh, doors that access those spaces and the canopies that uh, to us really create a, a sense of scale and place under those uh, and, and we'd love to come to a resolution with the city of Edmonton on just how we uh, resolve those existing trees and if they could be pushed a little bit further out eastbound closer to the, um, the parking strip. So that's our presentation. Okay, Thank you. sounds good. Thank you for the presentation. We'll jump right into questions. Craig, could you start us off? Uh, sure. Thanks for the presentation. I believe this is my first time seeing this, so I didn't have the, the opportunity to see it before. Um, I do appreciate uh, the, the materials and uh, the tactility of the, the materials um, to what's existing now. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say um, or any any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thanks for that, Craig. We'll go to Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Janice, and thank you for the presentation, Dean. Um, I'm wondering if you could just clarify, it was Councillor Stevenson and then whom else from the city said that the, you discussed the paving strategy? Oh, sorry, which strategy? The paving strategy for yeah. the surrounding sidewalk? Yeah, yeah. So it was Tom uh, Gervan. So his title is the director of the Downtown Vibrancy, Safe City, Economic Investment Services, Urban Planning, and Economy. So we met with him on site a few times, and he was the one that uh, came back to us after having. Uh, other discussions with city members, I'm not sure who with, but uh, saying it, it, the city would be in agreement if Morgard would use the same um, pattern that Enbridge had done so, uh, we would just not have to use the, the um, uh, granite pavers as long as it's cast in place concrete with the same coloring as well. Hmm. Okay, I, I don't agree with that decision uh, personally. I think um, what was established in that first phase of work uh, kind of set the tone for uh, what should be a really high quality uh, public realm of what was once a really treasured downtown space. And I worry that allowing a, a lesser material is kind of going to lead to the slow degradation of that plan and that kind of quality public realm uh, material and finish that was established there. So um, I I think that those are cast in place concrete pavers. There maybe is some granite involved there, but um, a lot of cast in place concrete. I would really strongly encourage that that same material palette be used on this project. Uh, cast in place concrete, it'll, it'll never look the same uh, with the stamping um and if repairs ever need to be done in the future it's uh near impossible to repair that and match it to look the same way that uh cast in, or uh, unit pavers will look whereas unit pavers can just be lifted up repaired and put back in place the concrete will not present the same quality of finish over time and so that that's my kind of one predominant comment on the project. I think what, and this is uh, Ed from the new ownership group. Um, I think what's leading to this, Kevin, is we've agreed to to do this in that pattern until such times as the city implements their program and they would come in and remove everything we've done and put their process in. Um, from a building owner's standpoint, we have a, an issue with the granite, a maintenance issue and a safety issue which has really driven this project. We have taken it upon ourselves at our expense to try to improve Rice Howard Way, which is 
we've been told is not in any plan for 10 years. And we've got a fairly major investment here. So we've gone through to turn the building inside out to include the canopies and to match the city finishes as best as we can. Um, and we're willing to take on the city land and maintain it until such times as the city's ready to do so. Um, there really is no appetite from the ownership to take it on and the increased maintenance costs of dealing with those issues. I understand what you're saying, but if you look at Jasper Avenue right now, it's already started to degrade to a certain point and, and we just can't take on that expense. So from our standpoint, we would be willing to put our level of finishes in their pattern, um, but if that's not acceptable, then we would do nothing on the east side, not take over that, and the red interlocking stone would stay there for 10 years. Okay. So I do understand where you're coming from, but we've been trying to find a, a, a common ground to stand on to try to get this area fixed up and cleaned up until the city implements their design. And that's really what we're trying to achieve here. So our conversations with Tom Gervin were, we will do this when you're ready to kick off your program. Um, we're perfectly willing to erase any agreements that we have in place to do this and maintain it and let you take the space back and put your finishes in. We just want a usable space and something that doesn't look like a back alley for the next 10 years. Beside the building that we're currently spending $35 million on. Yeah, uh, you know, perhaps my comments are equally as directed at the city that they understand the yeah, and, 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 I just, yeah, I just, and, just and that uh, it's going to be hard for them to come back ten years from now and tear something out that's only ten years old, quote unquote. Yeah, and therein starts the slow degradation of the plan. And yeah. so, yeah, I appreciate your perspective, um, and I'll pass it along to my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> hey, thanks for that, Kevin. We'll move to Nick. Thanks, Janice, and uh, thanks for the presentation. I just, uh, I've really just got one question. I mean, I, I like the idea. I think this needs some sprucing us and I'll make a big impact and some improvements. I like some of the materiality. Um, but if you could just maybe clarify for me some of these perspectives. Uh, uh, maybe there's an error in some of these floor plans, but on page uh, 18, if you go to it and you look at view F, um, is it view F? And then, yeah, view F is showing down the side, but you're showing it also along 100A Street, but it doesn't portray 100A Street. And so I'm trying to get that perspective. Um, I apologize, Nick. Yeah, if you look at that page, uh, it, what is indicated as view F, uh, so for the elevation along 100A Street, it's actually view C, view C. the bottom yeah. uh, left, right. Uh, so, so, okay. So, all right. That, yeah, that pictures. So, that view C is, is 100A Street looking at it. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the perspective is a little distorted because that's a pretty narrow lane through there. So um, there was another perspective I was looking at. But anyway, thank you for clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure I was trying to read this correctly. So thank yeah. you. My All apologies. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks for that, Nick. We'll go to oh, Emma. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, a couple of comments. Um, Obviously, the original base was extremely monolithic and maybe too much so, but I think you maybe have like far too many materials in the palette potentially. And I would maybe encourage a, a further simplification of the, the facade design. Like it, it feels like it lacks a bit of cohesion. It feels like a bit of a disconnection as you move from facade to facade. Um, like the stacked brick is really nice. That's a nod to the existing materiality in the district. Um, and you can look at a more modern approach, but, you know, say if you pair back a couple of material selections, you can do a lot of different things with brick, like the detailing, curbs, relief, lintels, patterning. There's like so much potential you can do with a couple of materials. And I would, I would really encourage that approach. 
Um, and then my second question is around if there are signage design guidelines that have been developed for tenants because they're such a, a key component of this design and development and I didn't see any kind of specific um, kind of constraints or guidelines within the package. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Yeah, I was asked that question um, uh, by the administrator of EDC just, uh, I think, Monday or Thursday of this week in regards to signage. So, no, we have not created a formal uh, design criteria yet for the tenants. Um, the intent is, and I, I respond back in an email, is that the existing signage over the three entries that indicates Rice Howard Way, um, those are new and those will remain as is. So signage that we're looking to incorporate would be for major uh, tenants that might take, let's say, uh, one floor within the uh, office tower and above, and they would get simple channel letters uh, at those entry points. So when you look at our corner entries uh, on the uh, brown uh, wood metal panel lookings, we say signage, signage, signage. So all of those would be individual, individual channel letters for major tenants, similar to what Enbridge did on 101st Street. Uh, they've got um, silver channel letters on their black granite. Um, beyond that, we're not looking at putting any tenant signage on the canopies facing Rice Howard uh, Way because those tenants will be food court tenants, not major ones. So I think a renderance might have still shown that, but we won't be doing that. <laughs> so the only place that we might have um, tenant signage would be the restaurants uh, and the tenants that uh, would flank onto 100A Street. Or Jasper, where the old bank used to be. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But that would be it for um, building signage. And I believe you had the similar comment at our pre-design, and in regards to materiality and maybe a few too many. So we, we really did look at that consciously, and, and I think you might have mentioned about the corner wraps as well. So looking at that, but you know, at the end of the day, we, we essentially have the brick masonry, uh, the metal panels, um, and uh, the glazing. So you know, we've brought in um some different colors of the metal panels but again it was trying to look at not trying to replicate another monolithic base to the building but trying to look at rice howard way with its eclectic architectural styles and materials and pellets and trying to break it down into uh, i'll say uh, smaller pieces so it doesn't appear like one uh long base a block long but um, smaller development so well, some of the other limitations too are the structural limitations on the second floor in weight loading and so forth. So I know it's granite now, but the granite basically supported from the ground up. Um, and there's some, been some structural issues with um, increasing the brick as much as we have. And uh, so I don't have, know. have you looked at all at uh, salvaging the granite and repurposing it into benches or some of the applications? Uh, we, we have. Um, so most of the stuff from the interior and the exterior is uh, being supplied to um, Architecture Clearinghouse and Habitat for Humanity. Um, we haven't looked at reutilizing it ourselves, no. Um, when we made the choice on the inside and the outside to cut ties with the granite, um, that was an all-encompassing decision. Um, but we are investigating ways to have it reused in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, I know Habitat for Manny has been looking at remanufacturing it into countertops and so forth. Um, so there's been a fair bit of stuff that's already been recycled and reused, and we will continue to do so. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Emma. We'll go to David. Yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I I'm going to sort of build off of Kevin's comments, but I, I do understand uh, the response uh, provided to the types of material. Um, I, I have found it very difficult to assess the existence of the end condition versus sort of the new surfaces and, and understand the design intent related to the patterning and, and the proposed interfaces between these materials. Um, you know, so like I'm, I, and I'm, I'm not too clear on, on, as I said, where this, where the patterning approach, you know, if, you know, with the charcoal colored concrete and with the, you know, charcoal banding, 
um, you know, will that patterning relate to the building or Rice Howard Way edges? Um, um, you know, how it's incorporating the existing tree and tree wells um, and and also the patterning along Jasper Avenue. Like it, it just, I, I don't understand the design intent with regards to that patterning. And <clears throat> also there was no information on how the existing trees and tree wells were to be formed. So I, I know that these are more minute details, but um, yeah, I, I'm not really following the, the patterning that's being proposed. I'm not sure, Dean, if you're speaking, you may be on mute. Sorry about that. It's popped on. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you we can. Us? Okay. Yeah, uh, going on mute got rid of the, the <laughs> feedback. Though, that we <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So, David, we after we got the comments from Tom, I walked the site again to just look at how the patterning had been created for Enbridge Center. And uh, essentially, the dark banning comes off all of the architectural piers on the historic buildings, and they marry up to that. So, um, of course, we don't have an historic building. We don't have any of those piers to guide us uh, that guided Enbridge. So what we did was take the distance between the fields and the banding and continued that language um, as it exists uh, and goes north on 108th Street uh, in front of uh, the historic Enbridge and continue that same um, uh, distances, I would say, uh, all the way to Jasper Avenue. So um, they have nothing to do with our elevations because they cannot pick up any architectural elements, but it's just trying to keep that same rhythm that was established for Enbridge. Yeah, I, I can understand that for the northeast corner and tying in that main entry. But I I I do have a bit of a difficult time following, you know, what occurs from that corner, you know, south to Jasper Avenue. Um, it it just seems out of place um and, and doesn't really go with the flow of pedestrian movement would be typically occurring when you have it. So anyway, um that that's, that's well i think what we've done is we we pulled the the uh, rice hardway concept design plan and we utilized that information and what was shown on that besides ghost place and that's what we we tried to replicate down the east yeah. side we have no intention of redoing the south end and the north end that's all new concrete that we did two years ago and right. we're not tearing out a million dollars worth of work just to change the pattern to match um because it was our if that's our finishes that's our 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 entrance way um but we did change our design on the east side to match what was in that concept plan right and and but, that's where it's come from yeah. the concept plan honestly has nothing to do with anything that was done on jasper avenue they don't tie in together and i don't disagree that i don't see how it ties in together but that's not really our decision okay. making we were told we had to match race hour the way which we had all right that's fine. Um, yeah, it, it just seems to be a bit of a disconnect. Um, and and I and you know just in response to um, your response on, on to Kevin's question, you know one of the biggest issues in my opinion because we, we I was actually involved in that first portion of the Jackson Avenue is you know, the level of maintenance once that's been installed. So. Um, I don't know. Is is are you going to be responsible for maintaining that east section of the way, or for as long, for as long as our finishes are in place, we are responsible for maintaining it? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think you know in response to Kevin's concerns, like you know to sort of mitigate the degradation of that those surface materials or you know the concrete materials. That yeah, some regular maintenance would help because uh, you can see along Jasper the lack of maintenance and how that degraded uh, the original finishes um, along along the street there. So, and then one last question, 
So there's no additional plate furnishings or planters or anything like that going on that east segment? Well, we don't know yet, David, until we hear from Melissa at the city about what happens with the trees, whether we can relocate them further east. Um, so we have some questions that need to be answered from the tree standpoint. Ideally, um, we did the work on um, 44 Capitol Boulevard down on 108th Street. When we did that, we took the tree wells from the city and we built in some benches and stuff around the planters and mm -hmm. raised them up a bit. Ideally, we would do the same type of thing here, but really it's gonna be the answer from the city on the trees. Um, our whole design is based around getting the finishes fixed up in that area and making that area not a back alley in the middle of our downtown core and, and trying to bring some life into that area. Um, if we can't do canopies, if I can't do storefronts, if I can't take, you know, there's a whole bunch of ifs from the city are going to be driving the boat as to how far we go and, right. and what we can get done. So we're really hoping to work with the city. Like I said, we've really taken this design and stretched it out from a maintenance uh, project to try to do something what we feel is great for downtown Edmonton. Um, but there is a limit to what we can take on and, and um, what we can capitalize and get get any kind of you know sort of return on our investment right okay uh, thank thanks a lot hey thanks for that david i uh, will go to ty yeah thanks uh thanks everyone for the presentation um i guess i would um I, I would start by just echoing some of Emma's comments around uh, the, the deployment of uh, various cladding materials. I, I don't um, I, I don't take issue particularly with any of the materials selected per se. I think they're I think they're all they're all fine materials. I think they all work together. Um, I um, I think that the struggle that I'm having a little bit is um, is maybe just looking for a little bit more rigor around like why they are where they are because I, I do find it um, what you know what went from like a, a fairly you know if if maybe a little bit boring and and staid building like at least kind of. Um, you know, kind of symmetrical and and a bit restrained, and and I find what we're seeing here is is quite uh, visually busy. Um, and I just I find myself looking for like reasons why the a certain cladding would start or stop where it does, right? Like I, I noticed that on on the one side, um, like that would look um, that would look cladding either side of the the main uh, entrance shown, like on page seven, for example. Um, you know, it creates quite a symmetrical entryway and, and a clear point of entry. But, you know, if, if I look at, um, you know, the other side of those wooden components, on, on the one hand, the windows kind of terminate at the at the edge of the wood, but on, on the north elevation, uh, for some reason, it overlaps with the wood, right? And, and I'm not sure, like, I'm just not sure what it aligns with. And, and then similarly, the treatment of those kind of white eyebrow fixtures, um, or you know the the white strips. I'm I'm just not sure why they stop where they stop, or or what um, you know what what the desired effect is there. And on on the east elevation, for example, it actually moves down and it doesn't do that anywhere else, but it terminates in the top of the door, for example. Sure. Right. So yeah. I, I think like for me, I'm just looking for a little bit maybe more more restraint or more um, maybe a bit more discipline around how and why the materials are the way they are. Yeah. Um, and and then the one the one area and I know you've been dealt a really weird hand uh, by the by the city here, but uh, right on the Jasper Avenue um, south elevation on the east side, um, I where it kind of turns uh, and wraps around that um, that weird little LRT entry that that I know um, is is really kind of a an odd terminus to, to Rice Howard Way there where it meets Jasper, right? And there's kind of that little food, um, the food kiosk in it. Uh, so yeah, so I'm looking at your page 20 uh, from your package. Um, I, I guess the, the one question, I, I see that you've applied kind of that perforated metal um, around the Jasper Avenue um, facade on that angled corner to create an opportunity for tenant signage. Um, I'm just really curious though why you decided to sort of drop 
that datum down lower than um, than the current condition. Because right now, I think it, um, you know, it is sort of a multi-story condition, and it and it presents a pretty grand approach to, to Jasper Avenue, which is you know a fairly yeah. main street uh, in in Edmonton. Um, so I'm just wondering why the decision to drop that down. Like, does it do you feel it relates better to other building elements, or is it in response to the the weird little um, LRT shelter? Um, condition or what but th those are kind of the yeah those are sort of the big questions I have about the the decisions around the exterior cladding sure well I'll start with your comments along the um, uh, Rice Howard Way and 100 uh, A Street um, again we're trying to work within the existing uh, building glazing as much as possible it's, um, and structure and structure so on the second floor, we've got existing, uh, you know, ribbon strip windows uh, that we're working with. So in order to minimize uh, taking off absolutely everything and starting with a, a new thing <laughs> from a budget perspective, we've got those kind of limitations that we were uh, working around. So and on that second floor, we do have a program that's been defined, which is the fitness center that's going to face onto Rice Howard Way and uh, a conference center that's going to face and have blazing uh, along 100 A Street. So looking at program uh, for those uh, di was uh, dictating sort of our architectural breakdown of those massing that we've created uh, uh, as well. So I'm, I'm, uh, I typically do not like symmetry. Uh, and so it, I, I think uh, asymmetrical compositions are a lot more interesting, especially in this case to break down uh, the mass that exists with the podium today on, on all three sides of the building. So that's how we approach that. In terms of that crowd on Jasper Avenue, bringing it a little bit further down uh, than the existing, that it is a two-story volume. The second floor does not come up to Jasper Avenue in that space. So again, we just wanted to create it a little bit more of a human scale, allow for tenant signage to come down a little bit closer to Jasper Avenue and just uh, change it as much as possible, knowing that uh, the footprint of that corner at the east of, um, of the building on Jasper has those sort of ziggurats uh, and just playing within that realm. So that was our treatment. And thinking that, you know, that's it's a large space. It used to be the Scotia Bank, but it could, uh, has capabilities of being one restaurant. It has capabilities of being uh, three or four under the same uh, owner, just trying to brand it differently. So trying to give as much possibility for uh, signage in that location as well. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Ty. Uh, we'll go to Jonathan. Yeah, I, I, share, um, I share the same thoughts as Ty and Emma on materiality, and I, I just, I feel like it's, it's not even a case of being, you know, asymmetrical, just seemingly random in some areas, and I just, that there there needs to be some sort of logic with some of the placement of materials like especially like for example the the horizontal fins um you know that those sometimes create a really unique opportunity um you know with shading and light and you know it's there's a lot of it on the north elevation um the perforated panel also um can do a lot of interesting things with light and shading um and it's kind of restricted to this uh, area on the north and it kind of like it perhaps it makes more sense where it is on the south but um i i would really yeah i would really think it, it could uh just have another look at uh the, the arrangement and the the formal drivers for which material they're going where um i think uh i think uh ty really hit the nail on the head there i i, I I don't really have any more to say than what I already said. I had the exact same comments. Um, so I would just suggest uh, having another look at that. But uh, yeah, that's all my comments. Okay, thanks for that, Jonathan. I'm not sure, Dean, if you had anything you wanted to add. No, no further response to whatever we said. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we'll go to Mindy. Thanks, Janice. Um, thank you uh, very much for your presentation, Dean. I actually don't have any uh, questions or comments, but thank you for your work. Thank you.
Okay, thanks for that, Mindy. Um, I My comments have already been taken um, by the remainder of the committee. I had very similar questions to Jonathan, Ty, and Emma regarding materiality. Um, and I think you've responded to that. Okay, so with that, uh, we'd like to thank you for bringing this before us. We'll take just a brief full break here before we jump into deliberations. Okay. okay, do we just stay on then? Or, um... uh, yeah, it's a public yeah. meeting, so if you'd like to stay on. I may ask that you just mute, though, because you yeah. are providing some feedback. Sure. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so maybe we'll open up the floor to the committee uh, for any comments, thoughts. I mean, I think just to elaborate, I mean, uh, my comments were already mentioned, obviously, but I think for me, it's just it's just so important because this is such a highly visible um, part of the downtown. This is right at the corner of Jasper um you know where the uh the central station comes out of the ground and you have rice hard way like it's just such a visible hot spot um and i feel like it just it really needs to be um designed in a way that uh you know the the gestures have to make sense like you, you want to be able to understand um how the facade is actually responding to the surroundings and also um you know some sort of formal logic to how the materials are you know in, interacting with the glazing how they're interacting with the ground how like it's like ty said like the how the um perforated metal uh is you know lowered in one area and doesn't align with the other side so it, it's just it's i think these are sort of critical elements in my opinion um and uh especially given the kind of you know location being so visible um I'm not sure Ty or Emma, oh, David and Kevin both raised their hands too. Uh, I, David, you can go first. Oh, well, I, I'll open it up for others to comment to what Jonathan was talking about. I was just going to bring something else up. So. Okay. Is there, I don't know, Ty or Emma, if you wanted to comment further on what Jonathan just said. Um, I, yeah, I, I think for, for me, uh, like a, a support position here would, would probably need to include um, a comment about, you know, requesting um, that they sort of consider the, the deployment of materials um, with, you know, with, with a little bit of uh, greater restraint or logic or discipline or, you know, I'm not exactly sure of the wording, but I, um, I could imagine uh, including a, a clause like that. I wasn't in the informal. Um, has it developed since the informal in a in a positive way? Do you, does everyone feel? Um, I I'm, I'm thinking back, right? I'd have to put the the pieces side by side, but I, I do remember some similar comments uh, last last time around. So I'm I'm not sure it's changed um, significantly. I, I would agree with that, Ty. I think it's, it's, as we're talking about that, where I see it as the most critical is on the Jasper Ave, right? Where I can overlook the, the white band kind of stopping randomly, um, but the, the Jasper Ave is, is, let's say, arguably the most important face, but maybe the most visible um and yeah just looking at that south the south elevation along jasper 
the materiality doesn't really lend itself to giving any sort of what's what's the word I'm looking here for to define the entry, right? Sorry, I'll just jump in. I I agree wholeheartedly with the comments kind of led by Emma and Ty on the materiality. I forget who it was who mentioned the signage as well and the lack of a cohesive signage strategy. And I think what's presented in the plan um, doesn't lend itself to the environment. It feels like, I don't know, a bit of a suburban power center signage strategy. And then just the, this is about urban design as, as well as the architecture. And, and I don't feel like it's very context sensitive, the way it's tying in with that materiality, you know, architecturally with the signage and in particular with the finishing of the public realm, I think is just, and my comments are really directed as much at the city yeah. administration as they are at the proponent because I'm worried that anything that's tagged with the downtown um, revitalization is, you know, going to go undergo potentially less scrutiny because it's such a critical issue that we're facing right now. And I kind of have to put that out of my mind and just focus on design. And I don't think what we're seeing is appropriate for the context. I, I think, Kevin, I was going to sort of say that I, I think the whole urban realm um, and where where more guards being forced to go is yeah. very premature yeah right? and i i i am very apprehensive about what's being presented and seeing that in place for 10 years until such time that the city decides to undertake the redevelopment of rice howard way like as i okay. said i i just find that any any enhancement to the public realm around this building at this time is totally premature. Now, do we do we have an answer for that? No, because it sounds like some of the existing conditions are is just falling apart and very difficult to maintain, so on and so forth. And you know, there is some semblance of you know, um, <clears throat> you know, providing you know a, a fairly barrier-free pedestrian route, but at the same time yeah it it just seems ad hoc and, yeah. and very premature and and what so what is the answer to that maybe the city does have to step up to the plate and support more guard in these urban realm improvements for that section of of rice howard way like instead of waiting 10 years to come back and then rip it all out like it yeah. just doesn't make sense to me which we know isn't going to happen no exactly <laughs> and i think the most dangerous thing the city could do right now is put the onus on the proponents to develop the public realm because it's just not going to happen in a way that's appropriate for this premier location in downtown well and it really shouldn't be there no there. it shouldn't be anyway right like and no. and you know in the, at, as far as i'm concerned like if you're coming back and redoing rice howard way which is a premier you know res pedestrian um um street that it needs to be done in an integrated fashion not piecemeal 100 percent um yeah. i'm yeah i i agree I, I completely agree with you guys i i'm also aware that a lot of the comments and the the flavor that emma and i um and, and jonathan have, have been speaking about are like, like they're sort of architectural choices and and that category of, of investment is is sort of um you know more guards intent to renew the building right to to make it uh attractive for its current tenants and customers and, and future tenants right so there's there's that sort of piece of it which which i'm really struggling to articulate in a way that um I guess uh, is rooted in the principles of urban design, right? Like, you know, the, the specific deployment of new cladding do doesn't really uh, matter to the public realm, right? But but then on on the flip side, there's uh, there's all the elements of 
improvement of the public realm, right? Which at, at this point, I mean, if I heard the answer correctly about street furnishings and, um, you know, landscape and, and things like that, they're, they're kind of pending further discussion uh, and negotiations with the city. Um, so that, you know, that kind of just leaves the, the opportunity for like paving patterns, which is a, a you know an infrastructure, like a public property infrastructure investment that that I agree is kind of premature to ask the the building owner to make at this point, just in the uh, in the hopes of you know downtown revitalization, right? Um, and and then I'm also torn because I'm I'm really aware that this particular building is is dealt a pretty rough hand when it comes to the the things immediately surrounding it like it's got on the north side that like big parkade entrance it's got on the south side um like that that dumb little pop-up which I, I think kind of um compromises the the street presence along jasper right so so i know that there's sort of complicating factors that that leave them actually not a ton of public realm um currency actually you know to, to work with there, there's sort of these narrow strips um of kind of marginal space that's mostly in shade and um, and the the paving surface, really, right? So, so I, I'm not sure what's um, wh what are the right comments and concerns for us to be focusing on in the conversation about the quality of um, urban design here, right? I think it speaks to David's comment about developing without a plan. That this project may be better off limping the public realm through until the city can undertake it properly rather than trying to put something in that they, you know, fits the pro forma and accomplishes uh, maybe narrower set of goals than need to be considered right now. Yeah. So, I mean, do we, I, I guess as a committee, are we able to, um, you know, embed that in our comments somehow that that we think it, it should be a, a higher quality of of you know paving infrastructure, for example, or or public realm, or like those conversations should be prioritized in in their um, negotiation with the city. Well, I, 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 as I mentioned, I think I think right now the pub the public realm or the urban realm is not to the quality that we would like to see it, and that really um that the overall you know upgrading of that public realm piece is premature and requires a more sort of integrated um approach that is actually led by the city of edmonton and not the proponent um because i, I think it's totally unfair um to lump that all on them um and say, well, we're going to end up coming back in ten years' time and and redoing the whole thing. Like if if there's no better time than now to do this, then you know the city needs to to lead that process. So I guess I'm just wondering, how, like, how do we as a committee best communicate that? Um, it, with regards to this particular application well i i think it, it is along the lines that the current the current uh, proposed approach to the urban realm um you know should uh should be reconsidered um uh, and and you know integrated into and 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 sort of driven by the city uh um you know, for this portion of Rice Howard Way, something along those lines. I think it's through our comments, Ty, and I think it, our comments would be driven home by the motion that we make. Okay, so can we maybe potentially start to focus on what, what those collection of comments would be? yeah i think it is i'll take a stab at it uh, but i really would like everyone to chime in it's the architectural approach through materiality and kind of patterning and arrangement that 
um, Ty and Emma and, and others, Jonathan discussed. It's the approach to signage. And it is the fact that the public realm can't be developed in a cohesive and thoughtful manner by this proponent alone. And that that needs to be, or we suggest that it should be led by the city administration to develop a plan that a proponent could then implement in the future. To me, it's those three things. Okay, um, so maybe to, to flush those out a little more, I don't know whether or not um, Ty and Jonathan and Emma could maybe focus on some verbiage around the architectural materials portion and potentially the signage. Uh, and then David and Kevin, if you want to put some thought and consideration to, I guess, which would be the first bullet that you talked about um, regarding kind of the urban realm area. Another item I'd add to the urban realm area is, is relocating or locating trees or planting trees. And um, our approach today needs to be to develop a really strong urban tree canopy that's done through proper soil plant soil systems and planting approaches that again are extensive infrastructure upgrades that um, need to be fully understood by everyone involved and that it's not so simple as just moving a tree cough in a few meters and planting a tree like we did 20 years ago it's uh it's a major undertaking that needs to be developed in conjunction with the other public realm elements and strategies. So I can add some writing to that. That would be appreciated. But I think it goes back to what Haley said in, in her just kind of overview of the project that, you know, the city's goals is to make this area accessible, beautiful and vibrating. Okay, um, as, as we kind of work through uh, those kind of three major buckets and bullet points that we had been talking about, um, maybe potentially uh, is, would anyone like to put a motion forward? Um, I, I'll, I'll make a motion, I guess, uh, then you if, can, if I make talk a motion, it out, David. <laughs> yeah, no, if I make a motion, I think we need to really make sure that, you know, um, that, you know, if, if it's a motion of support, which I'll put forward that, you know, that our bullet points that we've you know our discussion points are very clearly stated um and defined uh, be because as i said i'm i'm very concerned that if we make a motion of support that it, this whole thing will just move forward without focusing on our comments <laughs> so yeah and maybe i'll go back i don't know if it was emma or mindy that asked the question to the committee at the very start of um us talking about you know do do we think that there has been a meaningful response already based on our original comments just to go along david with your if 
if it's a motion of support, do we feel that with the comments we'll get there? I, I'll i jump in and say I don't think there has been much movement from the informal. And I think that because downtown revitalization, that a motion of support with conditions or recommendations, I'm worried it won't be sufficient to enact the changes that we're hoping to see with this with this plan. Yeah, and I guess that's that's what I was getting at, Kevin. Right? Like, do yeah. we do we think we'll get there? So maybe David doesn't want to put forward a motion. Maybe Kevin would like to put. Oh, forward. well, I, I guess this is a point of discussion with the committee members. Like, you know, um, we've discussed this before, and and you know, previously we had the the option of you know tabling this this is not an option any longer so it it is down to a motion of you know motion of support or non-support um most certainly if we feel that if um we do not see any response to a supportive motion then then i think we need to put forward a, a motion of non-support but as i said i'd open it up that that whole discussion about you know support or non-support to other committee members i kevin's provided his 10 cents worth <laughs> these 10 cents yeah <laughs> I, I i would say kevin that i i would be also be leaning to non-support um the, the way I really kind of dislike non-support motions. I, I just don't know if a motion of support, and, and this one's so tough because it's not just the applicant that I, I think is, is a party to this. No. No, not the major party to this at all. I'm not sure the committee's thoughts. I think I, I yeah, I'm I'm right up there with you, Janice. I think um, for me, it's the it, obviously it's unfortunate, like we've discussed, but um, it's it, it is also just the the changes or lack thereof, um, and because I wasn't here for the informal, but reviewing the comments when i was reviewing everything and sort of seeing has anything like has this changed significantly post the comments that is there and i think that's that's a consideration as well i mean you know everything else aside i think that also is um takes like a significant uh, component of whether an application is uh um it, it like the, the our comments are being addressed like I, I think that's that's like an important consideration for uh, support non support so um I, I don't think that should be overlooked yeah i would also be leaning towards non support like i think rice howard way is just so special i find in the city like it's so densely urban but when you move into like that middle space it feels like almost like it's a secret space like i've always loved rice howard way so much and i feel I don't know if it was Kevin who made that comment around like, and I don't know if it was just around like the signage, but the kind of the response is almost like suburban, like super center. It's just like, there's so much potential you could do with this corner site. And I feel, I feel like it, and I understand there's a lot that's <clears throat> outside of the application applicants control, but they also have, there's also a lot that is within their control. Um, and I, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just struggling with it a little bit. But well, I'll formally make a motion of if we're there, Janice. Yeah, I, I think I think you're there. Okay, I'll make a motion of non-support. Okay. Can I get a seconder? I'll second. Oh, Mindy, you can take it. <laughs> Why thank you. The second just moves us along. I, I don't want to say it doesn't do anything, but it moves yeah. along. I, okay, I Ashley, like could you potentially share screen? 
I, I would like to note that as part of the preamble, like I, I, I do want to, I, I'd like to make sure that we emphasize the fact that it's not necessarily the, the proponent's, um, you know, a, a development submission. I, you know, I don't think all of it is on them. As I said, they've been sort of backed into a bit of a corner here and, and, you know, have tried to, you know, pick up the pieces and, and put something together um, that best, you know, uh, responds to city noted requirement needs. And um, while still, as Kevin says, you know, still stays within their pro forma and, and addresses some of the ongoing maintenance issues they've had and so on and so forth. Like, I, I, I guess, I, I, I just don't want to put this all on uh, the proponent. I, I, I would like to make sure that the city needs to step up to the plate here and, and work with the proponent in, in addressing this. Yeah, and I, I agree with that, David. And I don't think that the verbiage in that first bullet point, like though though we straight up say that you know the city of Edmonton is a stakeholder in it and should be one of the people leading it 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 doesn't come across yeah i don't know if it's as simple yeah no that's that's works for me ty yeah um, just something as simple as that right like i think reading the bullet points they'll get the the message that the first bullet point is where the city has a stakeholder yeah, like I, I think the other two bullets personally are are things that that Kazian can address, that the proponent can address, like or or at least respond to. Um, Absolutely. And as I said, like the the rest, you know, <laughs> the rest of this is really hangs on that first bullet. And as I said, that has really nothing to do with the proponent. <laughs> Well, and there are things that are, you know, yes, they, you know, they, they, a nicely designed building will have a more positive impact on the, you know, the urban realm and, you know, the, the character of the city. But, you know, honestly, like the, the deployment of architectural cladding, for example, um, it isn't going to make or break the, the public realm in the way that like the city of Edmonton's commitment to, to you know, public realm as a key piece of downtown revitalization is going to. So well like I would said. love for them to come. I, I would love for them to come back with like you know a, a plan for the city to work on actually upgrading Rice Howard Way, uh, public realm, and um, you know a, a like a nice um, reclad of, of the building, right, and a repositioning of the, of the building. Yeah, yeah. My my biggest issue is doing a temporary fix and then having it sit there for 10 years. Um, doesn't, doesn't work well for me. <laughs> okay. So uh, before we go to a formal vote, uh, just kind of one last call to the committee of whether or not those three bullet points captures our conversation. And, and I'll just throw it out there. Great job, everyone. <laughs> banding together to write the three bullet points. Okay, I'm not hearing anything further. So we will go to a vote for the motion of non-support as shown on the screen. And we'll go in the committee question order again. So we'll start off with Craig. I'll support the motion for non-support. Kevin. Support. Nick. Support. Emma. Support. David. Support. Ty. Support. Jonathan. Support. Mindy. Support. Janice. Support. Okay. The motion has passed. Okay. So with that, um, moving on on the agenda. We are at item D, upcoming applications, conflicts, and regrets. Uh, 
Uh, we currently have no upcoming applications for February 7th. Oh, look at that. Now with, with that, typically it's the 10 days before, et cetera. Um, will we leave it open, I guess, Ashley and Peter until next Wednesday and make the formal call on that? Um, yeah, I think that might be a good idea just in case anything comes in tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it's just because our, our second meeting here is so, so early in the month, we actually have two more Tuesdays before. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Janice, just a small point of order. I have the Tuesday being February 6th. It is February the 6th. Oh, it is February the 6th. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's it's a, a typo. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I was in the right year. <laughs> I, I think we're in a leap year, though. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are, are but it's still February. <laughs> if I could add to the other thing that could be on the agenda would be a, a, a more in-depth work plan discussion as well. Yeah. Yeah. That could be true. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any <laughs> no one, I guess, regrets for February the sixth? Okay, not hearing any. Okay, so we'll go on to item E, other business. Uh, so E.1, we added to the agenda for the 2024 work plan update. And I'm gonna put Ty on the spot. Oh, it's not on the spot, Janice, but uh, yeah, I, I, what, what we pre-discussed is that I would give a little bit of a, um, just an overview of what we had talked about on the subcommittee um, in terms of what work we would want to take on in the, in the coming year in the work plan. Um, and then uh, Peter can fill in the blanks and all the things I inevitably miss. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, and if the committee has any questions or um, takes issue with any of it, we can we can reconsider uh, as we go ahead into working on the work plan. Um, so yeah, the items uh, the items that we'd identified and, and want to put um, I guess some more process around in our work plan uh, were um, I guess a review slash update, which is probably more of a review at this point of the standards and procedures. Um, and I say more of a review because it was sort of recently uh, revisited and, and reviewed and updated. Um, so yeah, I guess just looking at the standards and procedures again. Um, reviewing slash implementing the new principles of urban design. Um, and so that it would really be I think taking picking up on on where we have been um, following our workshop with this larger committee uh, later last year, uh, and then and probably moving more into a plan for how to implement those. Um, yeah, in, in terms of what's coming up next and and how to actually um, change them, there, there's probably a, a consultation uh, or engagement expectation of some level. Um, in terms of industry, even if it is more of like a, an inform kind of level of engagement. Um, but yeah, just really looking to how, how do we get the, those updated principles uh, into practice and, and out um, being used by the committee and by industry when they, they, when they bring things to us. Um, and then, you know, as a potential consideration, uh, at the very least, a review of the existing EDC boundary. Um, so some of the questions we'd asked in our conversation um, were like, is the current boundary uh, and you know the projects and project types that it's bringing to us um, meeting the original objectives of the committee? Like, is it doing uh, with, with the current boundaries as existing? Is it doing? Is EDC doing what it was meant to do when it was originally conceived? Uh, should the boundaries be adjusted? Uh, and so we discussed a, a few other potential models that could be considered. Um, including from some of Neil's experience on in other municipalities. Um, so, you know, ours is really based on geography, but, you know, other possibilities might include like scale um, that might direct something to EDC, typology, uh, other frameworks, right? Like what, what are we, what projects really need to come in front of EDC? Uh, and how does that, like, are there things getting through the cracks right now? Um, 
And then on the flip side, we also talked about like we, we also have to be a bit careful because we we don't necessarily want to say, OK, everything in the city suddenly has to come to EDC because there would be real impacts on the um, just the volume and, and the resources and the workload that um, that would be available uh, to projects if that were the case. Um, so some conversation about, you know, what projects should come. And then, uh, of course, Peter flagged for us um, that there may be an opportunity um, or depending who you ask within the city, even a need for uh, bringing that into alignment with the city plan. Um, so potentially it's it's even tied, you know, still to geography, let's say, but um, potentially to nodes and corridors um, identified within the city plan. Uh, so th those are some of the conversations we're having about, you know, reviewing the EDC boundary, even if we don't necessarily know yet what, um, what the answer to any of those is. Um, and of course, always trying to scope uh, our work appropriately given the um, our, our limited resources. Um, you know, we won't be able to within this one period um, kind of boil the ocean, but you know, what do we want to look at? What's most important? Um, and then, you know, a little bit more, um, I guess, research or investigation around like what is really uh, required or expected of us in terms of. Um, who do we talk to and who do we engage on each of those uh, potential issues? Uh, so that that's kind of where our head was at. Peter, is there anything you, you'd like to fill in the blanks on a little bit better? No, because I think you did an exceptional job. Um, all I'll say is uh, maybe for the benefit of the committee, why why it was suggested to bring this up is because the, the work plan is actually due on, on February the 9th. And this is really one of, two opportunities for the community to have some input and for the subcommittee to receive some license or direction to do this work. And um, it, in the notes I provided, I, I, I'm not suggesting that we would have a, a lengthy debate tonight, but there would just be some conversation that, you know, and, and the work plan is very high level. Um, it's really just going to say, for example, that of three tasks, one of them would be to examine the boundary. And, and that's it. There wouldn't be a lot of discussion in the work plan about what that entails. Yeah. Can I just add one thing before we go to David? Yeah. Now, it's my understanding, Peter, that we are going to put the work plan together under the assumption that our request for a subcommittee will be accepted. That's right. Um, I guess eventually we'll have to have the conversation if the subcommittee, our request for a subcommittee is not accepted. Um, what that ultimately means for the items that we've put on our work plan. Right. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. That's a really good question. And and um, most of the committee will, will not know that the civic agencies team did a presentation last week about the work plan. And uh, I had the opportunity to watch the video and I have a number of questions about the work plan relative to the larger strategic direction of this committee that um, I'm going to try to connect with um, the civic agencies manager this week to get more uh, detail about. It was a really riveting recording if anyone wants to watch it. I'm going to have to watch it later today <laughs> or another time. Um, I hadn't gotten to it yet, but um, I, I guess that the one question we like, the reason we wanted to sort of bring that outline to the whole committee is just to see like, you know, are, are there any like massive, things that you, you feel like we're missing or, or didn't identify in that work plan or any burning priorities that we didn't uh, didn't capture in that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Ty, I just wanted to make a point that if everyone got the work plan discussion outline that Peter sent out, the, the link to the principles of urban design. Um, so that has been like fully revised um, and updated. So I just wanted to point out that that there has been some work on that document um, since way back when. And so this is the most current version. Uh, so if if people are interested, they can they can go to that link and and see where we're at. So David, that link wasn't provided to the whole committee. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> okay, then you can't go and see it. <laughs> yeah, and sorry I missed you, David.
Okay, yeah, but I guess any comments from from the committee, the rest of the committee, in terms of like, do, do those sound like the right things to be exploring in the next year, or is there anything huge we missed? No, I think just Peter for us for the work plan. I think any of the items that we think are multi-year items, it would be really good to identify when we make our request for a subcommittee to say you know, from past experience of, of the other things that we have taken on, that these will be multi-year initiatives. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so, okay. Oh, sorry. As I guess as a next step, like, then, you know, we'll work on drafting the, the work plan and uh, we'll, I think, Peter, we're saying we'll, we'll aim to circulate it to the rest of the committee prior to our February 6th meeting. Um, you know, and, and have maybe a more in-depth discussion or get, get any comments on it at that time uh, in advance of submitting it on the 9th? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. That's the plan. Sounds good. Okay, well then... I guess we'll move on to meeting adjournment. We will adjourn the meeting at 8.05. Have a nice rest of the evening, people. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Bye. thanks, everyone. Bye.